So it's my great pleasure to introduce Joaquin Dupaso. Joaquin is a founding member even of the first uh, of our two ITNs. So he, he played a key role in these, uh, in these two, two networks. Uh, I mean, it's almost unnecessary to introduce him. He's a, a thought leader and a prom prominent person in, in bioinformatics. He's interested in functional genomics, systems biology, mechanistic modeling of omics data and their exploration. He's the director of the FPS in, in, in Sevilla and uh, one of the key figures in bioinformatics in Europe. Uh, we are very proud that he was part of our two networks and that he's opening our uh, two-day symposium here now with uh, causal modeling and machine learning applied to massive truck repurposing in rare diseases. Welcome, Joachim. Hey, thank you very much, Karsten. So, uh, thank you very much to all of you for, for I mean, for having uh, give me this opportunity of being, I mean, opening this this uh, last session. So we were commenting yesterday night that <clears throat> it was a pity that uh, this uh, COVID cross in in this uh, in this uh, MF <laughs> in this ITN because um, I mean, especially for you students, is networking is very important. So we were commenting yesterday that uh, the, it's not. I mean, you have to be good because you have to be good for your future. But but uh, it's not only that. People must know that you are good. So that means that you have to do networking. You you have to be, uh, you have to make you uh, uh, visible in, in this in this uh, field, right? So you have to. It was a pity that you that you couldn't make uh, the networking that uh, these ITNs are designed to. But I mean, try to squeeze this last this last meeting that we are having here to to try to do the last network here and and remember that you have to make the network. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we are doing in the. I mean, I'm going to make to make a mixture of of, of things, right? So I'm going to talk about rare diseases, but I'm simplify some of the methodology that you, that you use with uh, COBITE, in which we have been able of demonstrating the uh, efficiency of some of the methods that we are using. So um, you know that we are part of the Spanish network for rare diseases, and we our contribution typically is uh, related to the analysis of, of uh, uh, undiagnosed cases, um, typically this patient for which you have a, an exome or a genome, and there, there is not any mutation which is characteristic of the disease, and so they are undiagnosed. So they send this, <laughs> this uh, hopeless cases to us, so we do some research, and we have a 30% of uh, case resolution, which is quite okay. Uh, compared to the literature. But now, <clears throat> this is, um, I'm going to present you something which is more philosophical. It has to do with the way in which research is done in, in, in rare diseases. So, these are some facts on rare diseases. Uh, so, by definition, is uh, considered rare disease if, if, if it affects to less than one person among 2,000. Many of them affect even less people. Maybe some of ultra rare diseases affect uh, one person among two million, etc. So uh, typically, there are diseases which are thought to be um, rare by definition. But at the end, there are seven thousand. Actually, there are some uh, literature that say that there are nine thousand uh, rare diseases. So collectively, they affect to six to eight percent of the population. So it's like I mean, collectively taking collectively is like a, a prevalent disease, a normal, a regular prevalent disease, right? So most of them have genetic basis, and. Uh, there are very few treatments uh, available for, for only only four four hundred rare diseases have an efficient or more or less efficient treatment, right? So, what are the consequences of this? Mainly that the classical approach that we use for facing diseases is not very useful in rare diseases right? because typically you know that there are lots of people working on diabetes, working on uh, lung cancer, working on whatever, but we have 
maybe se se at least 7,000 diseases. So we don't have a lot of sets. We don't have 7,000 sets of scientists, of group of scientists working on any of them. So what happened is that at the end, uh, the research is very scattered. Hmm? Uh, obviously, in terms of treatments, it's the, it's the same. Pharma companies do not invest in rare diseases because if you consider one by one, if you consider uh, treatments for one specific disease, thank you. Uh, I mean, there is, there is not a, a niche of market for them because there are very few patients, right? So at the end, we, we should change a little bit the way in which we uh, do research and the way in which we um, try to cure rare diseases. Maybe what I'm proposing is not <laughs> the panacea, but I mean, we need a change in the paradigm. So um, we need... Firstly, probably to focus uh, on disease mechanisms more than on specific diseases. Because many of these diseases, actually, they share some of the disease mechanisms. Um, what is the advantage? The advantage is that uh, um, in that way, all, all this knowledge will, that we gain on mechanisms will break the, the disease barrier. The problem is that we don't have much detail on on mechanisms of rare diseases because they are mostly unknown, right? <clears throat> so, um, well, we we try to use mechanistic models, combine it with uh, causal machine learning to try to to gain some insight in in this in rare diseases. From the point of view of the uh, translational application, uh, we are going to focus on drug repurposing. Uh, why? Because, uh, because in that way, uh, we will be dealing with, with drugs for which the um, security profile, action, mechanism of action, etc., is already known. So the only thing we, we have to do is to prove that it's efficient in this disease. And uh, a lot of steps in the regulatory part of the of the of the approval for a, for a uh, dry is already solved, right? <clears throat> um, so at the end, the problem is that the relationship between the targets of these uh, already drugs already in use and the disease are unknown. What solution can we use? Again, um, some causal machine learning in combination with, with that, with uh, uh, mechanistic models. So <clears throat> I, I mentioned that in a previous uh, talk, uh, but it's, it's good to refresh <laughs> because probably you <laughs> don't remember. Uh, what are mechanistic models? So we, we use mechanistic model <clears throat> um, to provide a quantitative representation of the uh, functionalities of the cell. Uh, <clears throat> basically, what we do is to use uh, pathways, this biochemical pathways, uh, in which we have the relationship between um, the functional relationship between proteins, how proteins interact, but not only physically interact, but functionally interact with each other, and uh, what this protein does at the end of this uh, of these pathways. So, in some cases, they trigger uh, cell death; in other cases, they trigger I mean, out of, of I mean, it's, it's the, the, the way in which the cell uh, decides what to do, the fate of the cell, right? So uh, <clears throat> something which is interesting is that in, in this pathway, we can define a functional endpoints. So at the end of all these um, pathways, there are a function which is triggered in the cell. And the idea is to have something, some mathematical modeling that we can that we can use. So that would be the the, the framework and how um, genes interact with each other. And we can use uh, we can use data measurement that we have on the on the condition of the cell. And typically we use gene expression, which is a uh, data which is uh, nowadays is quite uh, accurate. And it's cheap to obtain. There are lots of this data, and they are 
sort of read out of what the cell is doing in this moment. It's has like a snapshot of what the cell is doing in this in a particular condition. So <clears throat> that would be a very simplified uh, picture of how one of these models works. So this would be the pathway, a toy pathway, in which you have an interaction between some proteins on the left that uh, receive some uh, input, some uh, uh, signal or whatever, and uh, they communicate to each other like in a circuit, and finally they trigger a function. And there are other type of pathways, which are the, the um, um, metabolic pathways in which uh, the functionality would be the generation of metabolites, but conceptually are more or less the same. So the idea is that we put uh, data gene expression data uh, that we measure in different condition on this map and we see what happened. There is a formula, a recursive formula in which by means of which we can say, okay, what would happen if there is a signal here and we have these states of activation. In that case, it would, the, the, the bulb <laughs> will light. So it's, at the end, it's like an electrical circuit, what we are, simulating here. And what would happen in the second condition? The second condition, we have a short circuit here. So the, the bulb will not light. So this is essentially what we have, right? Um, if you take real pathways and you take real data, you get things like this. So this is uh, uh, real data with the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Project. And we put the data on the on the model pathways. And we see that, for example, uh, some functionalities that you can uh, easily map to uh, whole cancer hallmarks, for example, DNA replication, which is how the cancer grows up. So if you, uh, put, you take sample from many biopsies of cancer, that case is uh, kidney cancer, I think. We, we choose here kidney cancer because there are lots of data of kidney cancer. So you <clears throat> measure what is the activity that you infer from the model based on the gene expression, and you do a plot, a survival plot. You can see that a patient with a DNA replication highly activated they have a bad prognosis, but significantly bad prognosis. So this is very significant. But you, you can identify other <coughs> cancer hallmarks like anti-apoptosis. So uh, patients with the anti-apoptosis activated, they die more. Patients with uh, an inactivation of cell adhesion, which means um, um, metastasis, have a bad prognosis as well. Patients with activated angiogenesis die more. So <clears throat> at the end, if we identify, uh, in that case, the cancer hallmark, but in, in other cases, we identify some function which are related to our disease or to our phenotype, we can easily follow the activity state based on the gene the gene levels, the gene activity, simply, right? Uh, but there is something, I mean, this is good, but there is something that I like still more of these models. The models are very interesting because you can simulate condition that doesn't exist yet. So you can take a condition and you can simulate a new condition in which you knock out a gene, for example, and compare and say, okay, what is the difference because between the previous condition and the condition with the knockout and see what happens. So you can sort of forecast what would happen in different situations. You can simulate, for example, the, the activity of drugs or whatever you can imagine. Probably you try to simulate something that uh, 20 knockouts and 15 overexpression, probably you will this I mean, distort the system too much and maybe it's not, um, I'm not sure <laughs> about the result. But for just one or two knockouts, it could be interesting. So at the end, what you do is to take the first condition, 
and to do knockouts. How do you do a knockout here? So, it's very easy. Simply, you substitute the value of gene expression by zero or by a very low uh, amount. In that way, you simulate. Uh, I mean, a protein inactivation is like is actually like a protein knockout, like uh, I mean, uh, removing removing the gene there. Hmm? So you can foresee situation in which uh, you have knockout that doesn't affect to the function, or knockout that really do affect to the function. So you can, before doing the experiment, you can sort of see what would happen. And actually, this is what we did. <clears throat> and I like very much this this uh, this paper. And I always say that once I publish this paper, I can retire myself. <laughs> very happy because this is what we call the revenge of the bioinformatician. This is <laughs> one case in which we uh, came up with the hypothesis. We tested uh, in silico the knockouts. And then we went for a experimental group and said, please, can you test if this is real or not? So they tested that it was real. So we, we uh, sort of uh, predict the, uh, the, the knockouts that will, I mean, not kill, but clearly damage the, the ability of the, of the cell to, to replicate. So this is something that, I mean, can work, and actually we published it in, in cancer research. So we went to the to the battlefield, <laughs> to the cancer battlefield, and we, we we won with our prediction. We were very accepted in the beginning, but it was nice. <clears throat> so I mean, this is another very nice example in which what we did was to use single cell to see what happened in a population of cells. And in that case is the um, glioblastom, um, in which typically you give the treatment, which is the uh, bevacizumab. Typically you remove the cancer, so there is no cancer visible. And in nine, 10 months, the cancer goes again. There is a recidiva and uh, the cancer is resistant to the treatment. So they say, oh, the cancer was, uh, uh, has acquired this resistance. So what we saw here is that if we mm, simulate the knockouts uh, caused by bevacizumab in the, in the cell population, what we see is that most of the cells were killed, but a few of them were not killed. And why they were not killed? Because this, I mean, this bevacizumab is mainly a anti-BEGF, this, uh, this protein, this protein BEGF is in the beginning of the BEGF uh, pathway, what triggers a lot of processes related to cell proliferation. So what's happening in the resistant cells is that they don't express BEGF. They are not expressing BEGF. Actually, they are expressing this other protein, this PDEGFD, that also triggers the, the, the same pathway. So you are trying to... Uh, inhibit a protein that is not there. So probably this is the, the silic clone, and the silic clone was there, it was not very successful. So, but once you kill the smart clone, then the silic clone promotes, grows up, and then when, when it takes over the, the, the brain again, uh, you try to kill them with an anti beg but they are not using BEG for, for growing up. So this is a very nice way in which you can, you can dissect what is going on at the cell level. So, uh, yeah, but what's the problem with this approach? The problem with this approach is that, that we rely on uh, these circuits that are drawn by uh, in, the, in the pathways. So the problem is that only one third of the genome is part of these pathways, right? So mm, two thirds of the genome, if, if they are relevant for the disease, we cannot include them in the model. It's, it's, it's a pity. Um, well, I, I must say that this this very nice cartoon was made by Shankut Kubuk, who was a, our student from the previous uh, ITN ITN network, and I use it very very much. So the, we have this problem. We have the, this problem with we need a lot for, for this modeling. You need a lot of of information, biological information. We don't have for for most of the you. So. Um, the, the problem is that 
the generation of this biological knowledge, I mean, the drawing one of these arrows is a lot of time for typically uh, this generation of biological knowledge is la several laboratories working and trying to demonstrate that this gene actually is uh, um, doing an activation of this other gene and then you can finally draw a line, a causal line. So it's this gene is causing um, phosphorylation, for example, this protein or the other protein or whatever, right? So um, and this is a problem. We cannot wait for 50 or 100 years for all these, all these arrows are, are drawn. So one thing that we thought is, uh, would it be possible to use machine learning to learn biology? So, OK, let's, let's let the system to learn biology. Hmm? Yeah, well, the problem is that machine learning has been applied in many scenarios in which you have this very good balance between the variables that you have to learn and the samples. In biology, we, we still, I mean, in, in term, we try to learn all the biology, meaning all the, all the possible interaction, direct interaction between proteins. We still have a lot of variables and we still have few samples comparatively. And actually, um, it's not only a matter of course of dimensionality, it's that the relationship between the genes are much more complex than the, the relationship between pixels in a picture. Mm -hmm. uh, pixels in a picture are related with the pixel, pixel around and make sense with the pixel around, but genes are, have crazy connections sometimes, so it's, it's not, it's not, this, it's not a, a problem at the same level. But something that we can do is to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. So we are not interested in, in, in ruining all the careers of all the biologists <laughs> in one month <laughs> and discover everything. But something that we could do is to say, okay, let's try to see if some proteins which are of interest for some reason can be related to the current knowledge that we have. So this is a problem which is um, affordable, probably, because, because, I mean, the dimensionality is much lower. So uh, I'm going to switch then to COVID. So we have some COVID funds to, to do some things. And something that we did was, well, we were participating in this um, COVID disease mapping, which they uh, draw up a, a very nice, very detailed map of the all the uh, process of virus infection and all the consequences uh, downstream on inflammation, on how the, the virus trigger the, uh, the immune system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, in that case, it was very easy because we have a very detailed map. So we, we, we didn't need to, to do anything with the, with the map of the disease. So what we wanted to know is uh, what are the connections between uh, targets of other uh, drugs, drugs approved for other diseases, what are the, the connect, connection between these targets and the disease map of COVID? And not to all the parts of the map, but to a specific part of the map in which we were interested on. So the advantage of having these maps and having these functions at the end of these maps is that you can focus on a specific uh, parts of the disease, so in inflammation and uh, immune system or whatever, right? So uh, we model this, um, this, this map and actually we have a well, version of the, of the uh, modeling of this uh, Hepatia model that is uh, includes specifically the, the COVID map. And what we did was to, uh, well, we have Carlos here for details, if you want to ask specific details on the, on the methodology. But at the end, the idea was, okay, let's try to, let's try to explain the, what is the behavior of the, of the disease map, in that case of the COVID map, as a function of the different drug targets of, of drugs that are already in use. We can manage to explain the, beha the behavior as a combination of one or several 
several targets of drugs, probably this, this drug will have an effect on the map, right? That, that was the idea. So we use uh, this uh, sharply uh, additive explanation to try to look for the specific relevances of specific um, variables, in that case, uh, drug uh, targets. And uh, well, we, we draw some some maps of uh, activity of this uh, this uh, drug target. So uh, we found different situations. For example, this is the famous chloroquine. The famous chloroquine uh, uh, acts on the map, but acts absolutely on all the map and many other parts. So I mean, it's like if you I mean uh, probably. Burning a cell is very efficient, but uh, but it burns to you <laughs> as well. So it's not. I mean, it's efficient for co combating the disease, but also to combat the 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 the, 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 the patient. So so I mean, we were focusing in specific uh, in drug in drugs which were more specific of, of uh, certain processes, and uh, I mean, we managed to. To, to produce a list of, of uh, drugs, and by this time uh, we saw that uh, in a publication that they did um, on, on a review on, on trials uh, that were for, for testing treatments and prevention of COVID, uh, all the drugs that were in, in trial for, for COVID who has uh, um, known target because they were drugs which were I mean, there were treatments that were more specific, like gas inhalation or whatever. So in that case, we, we don't know what is the target. But for these dr drugs uh, that a target was known, uh, all the drugs that were there were predicted by the method. OK, I mean, that, that could be good. But we wanted to, to have a, a stronger proof. So we use this, um, this database that we have. In Andalusia, Andalusia is a, is a, is this? I mean, you know, is the south of Spain? It's a large region. It's the largest region in Spain, and actually, is the third largest region in Europe. It has a population of eight point point five million. So it's, I mean, it's the same size of Switzerland or Austria. I mean, it's like a medium. Uh, size country in Europe. So and we have an, an advantage is that the, all the C, uh, health system is uh, digitalized and all the C, uh, health system uh, dumps the data into a large database and this di data are um, put in a way that can be I mean, queried. So there are structured data. We have also unstructured data, but we have lots of structured data. So we have here 13 million people. So probably, if not the biggest, is one of the biggest database with uh, detailed clinical information that we have. So something that we did was to to look for patients here for COVID patients for the first wave. And that, I mean, we started that in the for the first wave. So we have uh, in the range of 17,000 patients. And some of these patients have received uh, another treatment for other reasons, the vitamin, um, whatever. I mean, other treatments because they were having this treatment. They, they were infected. And we compare what happened with this patient that were having this treatment with, pa with patients that they were not having this treatment, uh, taking into account all the uh, covariables, right? Actually, we managed to to make a very nice circuit uh, because I mean, you know that accessing clinical information is um, is not easy. <laughs> In general, it's not easy because I mean it's protected. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, obviously it has to be protected. Nobody wants to have their own <laughs> life <laughs> exposed. I mean, I understand that, but at, at the same time, it's it's a problem for for doing a lot of studies, right? So what we managed to do is say, hey, well, what, what is the problem? The problem is extracting the data from the health system. Okay, what if we don't extract the data from the health system? So we managed to put some computing facilities within the health system 
and we can then analyze the data within the health system. We say, oh, that's, that's okay, that, we are happy with this. So we set up this circuit in which uh, uh, essentially we propose um, whatever, a study, we pass through the ethical committee, we then write the, the, this sheet of uh, evaluation of impact in data protection. And then they, since there, there is no impact in data protection and have the approval of the ethic committee, so they provide us with the data, we can do the analysis. And the only thing that we make public are the results, right? So that was very nice. I'm not going to, to talk about that, but that has been a, a, a complete change in the way in which we can do research now in, in Andalusia. And we are trying to open that to, to everybody, right? So finally, what we saw is that uh, there were uh, 21 treatments that were highly effective. So they protect clearly the patients. And actually, there is one who is very bad, who <laughs> is counterproductive, right? And actually, for most of them, we, since we have also uh, data on analytics, so we can follow the, for example, the, the lymphocyte counts, and we say we see how for this patient also the lymphocyte counts uh, was compatible with, a, I mean, with an improvement of the, the health, right? So, uh, interesting thing is that we have an enrichment of uh, of the, I mean. Among this data, we have a lot of prediction. Not all of them, actually. For example, we we didn't predict the the first one was was not predicted, but the second one was predicted. So I mean, that's for me. This is this is the definitive proof that actually the prediction were I mean relatively good because most uh, there is an enrichment here statistically. This uh, uh, that uh, of predictions that we made. Uh, with using the model. So if we then know that this model is good, we are in a situation in which we, I mean, this is, this is very nice because we have made all, all the roads from the, of scientific discovery of the scientific method proposed by Galileo Galilei, in which you have to formulate the hypothesis, do experiments and check if the experiments fit to, to the to the, the observation fit to the to the hypothesis we can do that without doing an experiment why because there are lots of data available so we can do everything without doing any experiment i mean it doesn't mean that that experiments are useless because these data were obtained by previous experiment but what i mean is that we have now so many data produced by experiment that in many cases you have the data already there, which is very important. So just for finishing, uh, we apply this, uh, we are applying this concept to the to rare diseases. And with the idea of, of trying to say, okay, um, instead of, of uh, focusing on diseases one at a time, we are going to focus on diseases as a um, particularity of the whole uh, cellular uh, mechanism and say, okay, these diseases are characterized by mutation in these three genes. These three genes are in this part of the pathway. So we have a representation, a small representation, not complete, but a small representation of the disease map of this disease. Maybe we have missing parts, but at least we have a part of the disease. And then we have uh, it was a little bit more than 150 rare diseases, which has mutation within the known pathway. So we managed to make this, uh, I mean, like, I mean, treating all the diseases like uh, a part of the of the of the cell behavior. So okay, this disease is here, this disease is here, this disease is here. I think we have here. I will show you another uh, slide later. So I'm running out of time, <laughs> or almost. So okay. 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 No, I'm, I'm almost finished. So, um, so the idea is then do something similar to this, and let me show you the, what I mentioned before using gene expression data and trying to learn if 
any specific uh, um, disease map can be explained by the combination of, of uh, target of other drugs. And the idea is to make this uh, systematically. So we have, we have the, the whole map and we map disease by disease, the genes in part of the map, and we build up these small partial maps of the disease. And we try to see what drugs could be acting there. It's not perfect, but it's something that can be do, done systematically and you can solve uh, in one shot. Uh, you can propose a lot of treatment for a lot of diseases. Mm? So the idea is we, we, we have the genes, the general, I mean, the, the, the current knowledge. We have the specific disease map, the models. And we do the machine learning for any specific disease and we look for the most relevant targets that are affecting that. And then we go for the validation. Uh, interestingly, you have a look at the. Oh, sorry. Uh, when well, you do this, I mean, this clustering, et cetera, et cetera, you see that there are different subclusters. So at the end, uh, with the diseases at the end, um, as we uh, suspected, many rare diseases at the end, they are, they are sharing uh, mechanisms. So probably drugs. Are, can be used for more than one uh, rare disease. So we have, I mean, a couple of, of validations. So this um, was published a couple of years ago, was two treatments that, that we uh, uh, predict for uh, Fanconi anemia were validated experimentally. And now they are a systematic validation of other treatment that we propose for retinitis pigmentosa. And we are working, since we are working uh, with uh, the people in the in the um, Spanish network for rare diseases, we are in collaboration with several groups that are doing the specific uh, validation. So it will take time, but at the end, what we provide them is with with some drugs instead of trying to see what would be the drug. So there are, there is a list of of potential candidates that they can use to to start with. Uh, well, I mean, this is uh, I'm finishing. Yeah, this is. A bit of publicity, so we have some software that you can <laughs> you can use if you want to use the models. And this is uh, the people and the, our uh, supporters. And let me just uh, show you this last slide: uh, the Baeza workshop. That uh, uh, well, I mean, this is the list of people. Some of uh, so, um, for example, um, Antonio is there. So it's going to participate and some of you uh, are attending. And this is another place in which you can do uh, networking, which is important. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. And if you have a question, I will be happy of taking them. Thank you. Thank you, Joaquin. Are there questions from the audience? Giovanni. Thank you for these very interesting talks. I have a couple uh, questions on uh, the whole talk. Um, one of them is on these explanation methods like SHAP. Um, I'm a bit familiar with. The problem is that often these post hoc methods are a little bit unreliable or vulnerable to adversarial attacks or some other issues. Um, how to say it? Have you found other than just making predictions and then validating the drugs, have you tried to find uh, alternatives to that, like ulti using multiple of these interpretation methods or something that could give you an idea before the experiments if, um, how to say, what you are hypothesizing as a reason to be considered valid. Yeah, well, I mean, apart from Carlos can give you a later a more detailed explanation, uh, from the point of view of the focus, uh, or why we focus first on, on SHAP is, uh, I mean, typically we, we go very fast. So we, we need to solve problems quickly. <laughs> and that was, um, well, I mean, a simple way of trying to see what is the contribution of any of the variables that was more difficult to obtain from the, from the, from the model. I, I mean, I don't think that um, adversarial attacks here are relevant because we are, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not the case here, but it was, it was, um, 
I mean, simply, um, since we are doing a prediction based on predictions, et cetera, et cetera, so probably we are not going to be very, uh, you know, <laughs> picky with, <laughs> with the methodology. To say. It was only uh, the necessity of trying to figure out what of these uh, variables was having a bigger or a stronger effect on the, on the pathways. Thank you. And a curiosity, if I can quickly, before somebody else asks a question, uh, you showed uh, that you used, for example, keg pathways. And a few times I've looked into them and the thing is they are a bit of a hodgepodge of genes and metabolites and maybe sub pathways. How do you actually convert something so complicated to a relatively simple model like the ones you were showing? Yeah, well, I, I didn't mention that. So dealing with pathways is a nightmare because actually we are having problems of using keg pathways because you know that keg now has, has become uh, not private, but I mean, uh, you have to pay for rights or something. It's, it's, it's a bit problematic. So the point with with care is that um, they they have they, they are um, they, they are these metabolites, but the metabolites can be easily removed. But typically, they are uh, I don't remember the name, but activity pathways, meaning that they have essentially proteins acting on other proteins. We would have preferred to use, for example, reactome, because we have a lot of relationship with the EBI, so they are pressing us to use reactome. The problem with reactome is that they have not only metabolites, they have a lot, many parts of the map are, for example, how a protein, how different proteins make a complex. So all these arrows cannot be modeled because what, what we have is, a, uh, is a, a snapshot of the gene expression. So the idea that we have is if we have all the, all the proteins of the complex, the complex is there. <laughs> we, we need only one node with different proteins. But, so it's very difficult for us to convert all these um, arrows that are not functional activities uh, in the map, but are other representation of the biological knowledge to convert, because something like 50% of the arrows in a reactome are all this stuff. And this stuff can, I mean, it's not useful from the point of view that we want to use the map, that is to put uh, gene expression data and to see what happens, right? But it's a, it's a nightmare. You have to do a lot of, it's not, as immediate as putting the, the, the map in the models. You have to do a lot of manual curation. Thank you. Other question here? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Joaquin, for, for being here and for the great presentation. And uh, I'll keep it short in the interest of time, but just two quick questions. The first is going back to these mechanistic models that you showed at the beginning. Is there any work on longitudinal, longitudinal aspects of these? like how the connectivity evolves over time during development, for example, of organisms. And the second is this huge database that you showed of healthcare uh, data in Andalusia. What's the prospect of actually, like, actually accessing that database? Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna answer first the, the second one. Um, we have a, um, a, some instruction for, for using the, the, this the data. So, uh, so it's something very similar to what I draw there. So firstly, you have to uh, ask permission for the to the to the ethics committee. For most of the, I mean, if you if your uh, study is reasonable, you will get the permission for sure. And the second and most problematic step is to pass this evaluation of impact in data protection. So typically, you just uh, fill a, a series of questions. So is the data uh, going out? If it's going out, how you um, um, guarantee that the data is not spread out? You, um, uh, you are not going to try to identify patients, etc., etc. So what happens is if you get out the data from the health system, you check one of the, one of the most horrifying uh, 
uh, checks and then you don't get the approval for for it. so what we did was to to set up that in a, in a way which uh, now is not perfect but it, it works so you have to ask essentially you have to ask us to do the to do the job so what we are trying to do now is to habilitate a system by means of which uh, once you get the approval of the ethics committee you can access you, you can manage the data without having access to the data something like using a virtual uh, a virtual mon monitor whatever in which you you are you can do things but you cannot copy the file outside uh, this is a, only a technical problem and we are trying to see how to solve it as soon as it is solved probably uh, it will be more open to you because we want to, to I mean, to become uh, leaders in, you know, in exploitation of, of, of clinical data. And the first question was, I don't remember, sorry, was there something the connectivity or what? We're working on the longitudinal evolution of these models, like how the connectivity evolves during development, for example. In the uh, what connectivity? If you... The connectivity that's represented in the mechanistic model. You, you <laughs> Yeah, the, the connectivity that's represented in the mechanistic models that you showed at the beginning. I was wondering if there's any work on how those evolve uh, over time during development, for example. Um, mm, no, as far as I know. So I remember that we did um, a very simple study, but using uh, enrichment, uh, gene, uh, gene ontology enrichment, etc. So we saw how the function evolved uh, a long time in a system like it was a GISM, I think. It's interesting to see how functions move across time. But no, I, I, as far as I know, there are probably there are some study, but <laughs> I don't know. Thank you very much, uh, Joaquin. Thank you very much for asking the questions also. Um, thank you for opening our symposium. Um, so a round of applause. Thank you very much. Yeah.